Man, it's good to be back with you. My name is Brandon Hudson. Uh, what a great morning. This is a uh, great church. I got here this morning, was back in Pastor Mike's office, got to talk with uh, Pastor uh, Abner here for a little bit, just hearing his heart uh, for the ministry that he's going, the opportunities he has to be in seminary right now, learning and uh, leading that, that um, part of his church. Um, then got to be a part of the first service here, and then got to witness the baptism with Pastor Mike being back with you guys. That, the, the, what that symbolizes, that picture is going far more powerful than anything that I have to say. So that, that was incredible. And just know that there are churches in, in this country uh, that do not get to experience that. Um, do not take that for granted, which, which you got to witness this morning. Just the picture of what Christ has done in our lives and, and two people's lives being changed. Not just for, for now, but, but forever. Uh, and then getting to watch the lady down here just sign. Hearing, hearing, hearing the, the text read in Spanish and then seeing her sign and just add it during the songs. Um, and what's funny right now, she has to sign all of, as I compliment her, she has to <laughs> sign it about herself, which is pretty funny to think about. No, this, this is a great church. I'm thankful to be with you guys. I'm going to start out with a story. Uh, 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortez. I checked that pronunciation, Pastor Abner, before I got started. So that's how you say it, Hernan Cortez. He set sail for the Yucatan Peninsula with 600 men. 600 men set out to go to the Aztecs to conquer them, defeat them, and steal their vast treasures. Well, Cortez, as he was preparing for the journey, he didn't just take any men with him. He didn't just take those that were good with fighting. You see, many people had come before him to try to take the treasure. Many people had come to try to defeat the Aztecs, and every single one of them had failed so far. So what Cortez needed were not just men that were good fighters, but men that were driven, men that were passionate in what they were doing. So before they could join his army, he interviewed every one of the 600 men. And he asked them one question. What are you going to do with the treasure when you get it? What, what's your future with this treasure? What will your life look like? How will your family for generations be different as soon as you take hold of this treasure? He wanted to take, uh, take them and paint a picture in their mind for what the future could be once they were victorious. And then again, they're on this long journey by sea, and the men are losing resolve, and they're wavering. So again, Cortez holds this vision out for them. This is what your lives will be as soon as you take hold of the treasure. So then finally, months of sailing pass. They finally get to the shores. They get the big boats as far as they can get. They climb down into the smaller boats. They get onto the shore. The men start to gather. They're waiting for that big motivational speech before they go into battle. It's, it, it's kind of like the, the pregame speech from a high school football coach. I didn't play high school football. I was like 140 pounds and six foot tall, been broken in half. But I do remember at Reynolds High School, we were a pretty good football team. We had one uh, a big game coming up. And the, the coach before the game, he's giving the talk. He's getting them pumped up. All of a sudden, he grabs a phone book and he rips it in half with his bare hands. And the high schoolers just go nuts. They storm the field. They're so pumped up. They win the game 49 to nothing. That's what Cortez's men think are about to happen. He's going to rip a coconut in half with his bare hands, and they're going to take the Aztecs. But that's not what happens. They gather around. They're waiting for the speech. And Cortez gives one simple message. Burn the ships. Burn the ships, he says. They look around confused. He continues, burn the ships. If we are going to go home, we're going to do it on their boats. We are going to do it on their boats. He left no other option. It was either they, they kill the Aztecs and take their treasure or they be killed. There was no other way. And after some hesitation, the men lit their own ships on fire and they, they defeated the army. It worked. With their, with their backs against the walls, they defeated the Aztecs and they took their treasure. Everything that competes with, our, with Christ in our lives has to be set on fire. Everything that would pull us away from him doesn't just need to be set in the corner, but it has to be destroyed. Everything that competes with our service of God and our joy in him must 
be set to flame. If that seems intense, it, it is, it is intense. I'm going to try to make the case for that from our text this morning. So let me reread our, our three verses. Look carefully then how you walk, Paul says, not as unwise, but do it as those who are wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There's two key assumptions. Before we break down these texts, we have to understand two key assumptions that Paul has that are underneath this text. And they're these. Christ touches everything, and everything affects everything. Christ touches everything, and everything affects everything. First, Christ touches everything. Every day of the week, every part of us, mind, body, and soul, our heads, our hearts, and our hands, Christ affects every one of those. One of the core ideas and key phrases that we have to help redefine for the church is one I actually talked about last time I was here. It's the idea of eternal life. Eternal life. John 3, 16, the, the poster verse for Christianity says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever would believe in him, they won't perish, but what? They'll have eternal life. If you go to any football game in the South, you're going to see it held up on a banner. It is our verse. It is the Christian verse. And for good reason. The promise is incredible. That no longer will sin lead to death, but it will actually lead to life because of the finished work of Christ. But that promise for eternal life is not just one day in the future. It's not just for when we grow sick or when we grow old or when we die and we pass on from this life to the next. That is not the primary way Scripture talks about eternal life. The primary way Scripture talks about eternal life is right here, right now. It's what I said last time. Eternal life is less about a quantity of life, and it's more about a quality of life lived in the presence of God. It's John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know God is to have eternal life. Eternal life is a relationship. It's life lived in the presence and the power of God, starting now and continuing forever. In John 15, 11, right after telling us to keep his commandments, Jesus gives us the reason why. If you've ever wondered why, why all these rules, why all these commandments, why all this stuff that we have to do and live by, it, it's not to keep God happy with us. It's not so that he won't smite us. It's this, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. God wants you to be full, to be filled with the joy and to the extent that we believe that, that God's commandments are for our joy, is the extent that we will experience his joy in our lives. That we'll, we'll experience his blessing in our relationships, in our marriages, in our family, in every single area of our life. God really does want you to be happy. He really wants that for you. He just knows the only way it's going to happen is when it's found in him. I, I've heard youth group talks. I've been in church four times a week from nine months before I was born until now. I've been on staff at churches for 20 years. I've heard about every sermon there is to hear. And I would always hear these youth group talks about uh, Christianity. It's, it's not just something over there on the side. You can't, you can't just have a piece of it. And the, the, we would hear phrases like, Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Right. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And it, it's true. Um, but, but I never understood the motivation. Here's what I heard. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. So get in line, you idiot. Or so stop being dumb. You can't have your Bible in one hand and a beer in the other. That's how I always heard it. But that's not what I see from Jesus in John 15. What Jesus is saying in John 15 is an invitation. He's inviting us into a life of joy, where Christianity doesn't just affect my future someday when I die, but where the presence of God and the joy and the peace and the love that only come from him begin to permeate and impact every single area of my life right here, right now. And so if we believe that God wants to impact my life here and now, if I believe freedom and joy in life are only found in him, then there's a seriousness and an intentionality that has to come over every part of our life. Every choice I make, every thought I think, every feeling I feel should be saturated in Christ. So that's the first assumption that Paul's working off of. Christ affects everything. 
The second is this, everything affects everything. Everything affects everything. A few years back, I really wanted to get into shape. I've always been kind of skinny. I'm, not, I'm what they call skinny fat. So kind of look skinny, but really not much muscle and a little bit of a belly. Wanted to get rid of that. So my buddy was a personal uh, trainer. He's a performance coach. He actually didn't just train, he trained kids, but he trained all the way up to high level uh, professional athletes. I'm like, okay, this, this is the time. This guy's gonna get me into shape. Side note, um, w- when I would travel with him, it, it was maddening because we're, we're on this flight. I'm in the row in, in front of him, he's behind me. And what's the question you ask everybody when you just kind of make small talk? So what do you do for a living, right? So the lady next to me turns and asks what I do for a living. I say, I'm, I'm a pastor. End of conversation. For an hour and a half, that, that was all we spoke. She had no follow-up questions and didn't seem to want to learn anything else. My buddy behind me, personal performance coach, asked him what he's doing. They're in a two-hour deep conversation about everything fitness in life. It is, it's just maddening. Um, so I asked Colby, hey, I need a workout plan. I'm like everyone else. Help me get in shape, right? He wouldn't give me one. I, I was like, man, just give me the reps, give me the sets, give me the exercise. What am I supposed to do? He's like, I'm not giving that to you unless you come to the gym and I'll put you through a full evaluation, a full performance evaluation. So I go, go over to the gym for this evaluation and it is the most in-depth thing I've ever been a part of. He's asking what I eat. He's asking how I sleep. He's, he has me walk across the room. Then he has me jog across the room. Then he has me run across the room. Then he has me doing these ankle tests where I'm like leaning up against a wall to see how bendy my ankles are. Everything he wanted to see before he would give me any type of plan because he understood this. Everything on me that moves affects every other part of me. It's why when your ankle hurts, eventually your back starts hurting because you compensate and it works its way up. Well, it's the same in every area of our lives. There is nothing neutral in our lives. Everything we look at, everything we do, everything we read, everything we watch, everything we eat, everything we drink, every relationship we have, every joke we tell, every song we sing affects us. Every single one of them. It's all connected. There is no area of our life, small or large, that we can hold on to and think, this isn't going to affect the rest of me. It just doesn't exist. Every habit of our lives is shaping us. Everything affects everything. So it's with these two assumptions, Christ affects everything, everything affects everything, that we can now look at what Paul has to say. So he begins and he, he says, so then look carefully at how we walk. Look carefully how you walk. In other words, take an inventory. Carefully examine how you are living your whole life. How do you use your time? How much time are you watching TV? How much time are you spending in good, focused conversation with others? How much time are you on your phone each week? When you're on your phone, what are you looking at? Are you refreshing the stock market every five minutes to see what your investments are doing? Are you scrolling through Twitter to see the latest Uh, political and societal arguments? Are you scrolling through the world of images on Instagram or TikTok? What are you reading? What does your prayer life look like? How often are you in the Word? How do you use your money? Are are, Are you generous with the money that you have, or are you so leveraged on credit cards and mortgages and auto loans and boat loans that you couldn't possibly live generously? These are just some of the questions Paul is inviting us, or rather commanding us, to look at when he says this. How are you using your time? And he does this because he says the days are evil. The days are evil. I'm like, whoa, Paul. A bit intense. Paul is not saying the days are limited. He's not saying that you only have 50, 60, maybe 80 years on this earth, so make the most of it. That may be true, but that's actually not his point here. He doesn't say the days are short. He uses a moral word. He says the days are evil. The days are evil. He calls them wicked. This is a massive point that we have to understand because the tendency is to float through life, going along with the flow, believing that for the most part, the world that we live in and the things that are coming into our lives are just neutral. But Paul says that's not true. We are either in a state of being pulled towards Christ or we are being pulled away from him. There is no middle ground. Listen to how Donald Whitney says it. It'll be up on the screen. 
It says, even without the kind of persecution or opposition known by the Christians of Paul's day, the world we live in is not conducive to using time wisely, especially for purposes of spirituality and godliness. In fact, our days are of active evil. There are great thieves of time that are minions of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They may range in form from high-tech, socially acceptable preoccupations to simple idle talk or ungoverned thoughts. But the natural course of our minds, our bodies, our world, and our days leads us toward evil, not towards Christ-likeness. Let me state it another way. If we are not persistently and actively and recklessly pursuing Christ, you will be pulled away from him every single time without fail. Our habits and our time are like water running down a hill. Water always takes the path of least resistance. If you watch it over time, it begins to develop little grooves and channels. And then as it gets into those, it eats them away. Eventually it becomes creeks and rivers. And given enough time and enough water, it'll eat away at entire mountains as it creates things like the Grand Canyon, these giant gorges. And those shaping waters in our lives will either create rivers of life in us where the fruit of the Spirit flows into our lives and then flow out of us, or they will create rivers of death where envy and strife and addictions and hate and pride well up inside of us and they begin to impact those around us. And so Paul continues. He says, therefore, don't be foolish. Do not be foolish, but instead understand what the will of God is. Paul points to the only source of truth that will give us wisdom to fight against an evil world. He says the will of God. So when we hear the phrase, the will of God, if you're like me, I, I think our, our minds first go to this idea of guidance. What does God have for me next? Where should I live? What job should I take? What house should I buy? If you're a student, maybe you want guidance on what college to go to. Uh, when I was a high school pastor, I did that for seven years. You could have been the most disconnected student in our ministry, and first semester, senior year, all of a sudden you were right there connected because you wanted to know what is God's will for my life? What college am I supposed to go to? We, we wanted uh, God to solve that problem that we were having. But here's the reality. Guidance is not the major idea of the will of God. God's far less concerned about what you do, and he's far more concerned about who you are. He's far less concerned about the decisions you make, and he's far more concerned about who you're becoming. Remember the story of uh, Captain Sullivan, the famous, uh, the, the plane that landed on the Hudson River. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, here, here's the brief of it. He takes off from LaGuardia, and as they're ascending, just leaving the airport, they hit an entire flock of geese, takes out both engines. And so they're at 3,000 feet above sea level, and they enter into what's known as a glide descent. No power, no ability to go up or down. They're just, they can steer, and that's it. So immediately, the pilot starts running through the options. What do we do? So first, can we get back to LaGuardia? No, we're, we're too far away to make it back. We don't have enough power to get there. Okay, there's a smaller airport close by. Can we alert them and get there? No, nope, we don't have time. So he just makes the split second decision. All of this happening quickly. We're going to have to land on the Hudson. We're going to have to land on the river. So he does a very difficult procedure. He lands on the Hudson River and ends up saving all 133 passengers on the plane. So afterwards, Sully's being interviewed by people like, how did you do that? How did you stay calm? How did you make those decisions that quickly and save the lives of all those people? And this is what he said. He said, for 42 years, I've been making small regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. And on January 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. Sully was a, he was a former military pilot. He had 20,000 hours of flying experience. His epic landing on the Hudson was the fruit of 42 years of preparation. Nobody makes a movie on the 42 years. But you couldn't have the movie or the landing unless he had put the time in. That is more of what the will of God is for our lives. It's less about the big decisions that we make, and it's far more about the mundane decisions in the habits of our everyday life. And then allowing those things to shape us and become the type of person who can do the incredible, who can do the extraordinary. 
Let me say it another way. What you accomplish for God's kingdom is determined by what you do on Monday morning at 7 a.m. It's determined by what you do on Thursday night at 9 p.m. It's determined on how you spend a Saturday afternoon at 11. Those are the things that shape us into doing the extraordinary. Paul, again, he's emphasizing the type of life that is daily seeking the presence and the power of God, laying aside everything that would pull us away and turning to what would take us to Christ. So as we close out this morning, I want to go back and just focus on the, the one big idea. It's a really simple, straightforward truth in this passage. Be careful how you live so that you can fill yourself with Christ instead of filling yourself with what is evil. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. But the problem is it's all-encompassing. There's no third way. He doesn't leave another option. It's either Christ or it's evil. It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31. He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Our eating, our drinking, even those things matter. Even those things shape us. And again, God is not concerned about these things because he's just needy. It's, it's not him just sitting up there looking down at Brandon, just disappointed, and just he's lonely, and he just needs me to praise him one more time today. That, that is not what he's doing. He wants more for us. He's a loving father, and he knows that we either direct every thought and decision towards him, which leads to life, which leads to joy, which leads to peace, or we direct it elsewhere, and it leads to pain and hurt and despair. But man, it, it's so easy to grow complacent, just to coast through life, to think the stakes aren't that high. We just settle into our days and our weeks and our year. We get into our habits. We get into our rhythms. Every week looks the same. And then we come here something like this, and I'm talking about Cortez burning ships, and it just seems like overkill. It's like, chill out, man. It's not that bad out there. But then I come across a video like this that we're going to watch. It's, it's by the company Dove. They make like the lotion and the soaps and all that. They, they have this campaign called The Cost of Beauty. And they're, they're seeking to fight back against some unhealthy trends in, in health and beauty and these expectations that are placed on women. Um, and one of the things that they specifically attack in it is social media and the way that it forms our view of the world. So as you watch this, notice this girl's transformation as she goes from just a young, innocent girl who then gets a cell phone, and then it changes uh, the trajectory. A oh, warning before you show it. Uh, I didn't cry last service because I sat over there with my eyes closed and my ears plugged, but I've watched this like 15 times and I've cried. It, it's pretty heavy, um, so I just wanted to give a heads up, but let's, let's turn and watch this. I just, I watch that, and every time I, I think about my daughter, I think about my son, I think about the kids in our church, the kids that my kids go to school with, and the war that is being waged on their hearts, and their minds, their bodies, and their souls. And if, if you don't think it's a war, then you're not paying attention. The, the stats are clear. Remember, it was 20,000 of hours of preparation for Captain Sully, right? 20,000 hours over 42 years. Just to focus on social media, the average 16-year-old spending six hours a day on social media. Six hours. That's 42 hours a week, 2,184 hours a year. So from the age of 13 to 22, that's 21,840 hours. More than Captain Sully. And if you don't think that's shaping a generation, you're just not paying attention. The, the smartest people in the world, Silicon Valley, are algorithmically designing your phones and the apps on them to hold your attention and to shape you. Social media ad revenue is projected to reach $300 billion this year. $300 billion. These companies are betting big that what they're putting out there is going to impact you. They're not just throwing that money away. Because the truth is we are far more malleable than we think we are. What we put into our minds, our hearts, and our bodies is what we will get out every single time. What comes in through our eyes and our ears, it determines what we think about. It determines what we dream of. It shapes our imaginations, and our imaginations shape us. If you don't think that's true, 
take your little kids down the toy aisle at Target. All of a sudden, perfectly happy kids who were content in life see a toy they didn't even know they existed, and now they can't be happy without it. These things shape us. They, they rise up, and they shape our longings and our desires, and they pull us towards these things. It's why Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, this is what he says. It'll be up on the screen. Ultimately, nothing in this life apart from God can satisfy our desires. But tragically, we continue to chase after our desires ad infinitum. The result, a chronic state of restlessness or worse, angst, anger, anxiety, disillusionment, depression, all of which lead to a life of hurry, a life of busyness, overload, shopping, materialism, careerism, a life of more, which in turn makes us even more restless and the cycle spirals out of control. Guys, this, this is not a game. The days are evil. It is not something that we can take lightly for ourselves or for our families. It's why Paul in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he turns to the metaphor of war. He talks about spiritual warfare. He's not being hyperbolic. John Owen, a Puritan, says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. There, again, there is no in-between. There are casualties to how we spend our time and how we are formed. There are things that are happening. The casualties, they're in broken homes and marriages due to alcohol and abuse and porn addictions. The casualties are in bodies and lives being destroyed by drugs, people living for the next high. The casualties are in unborn babies and abortion numbers as we seek a life of sexual freedom untethered from the natural consequences. The casualties are in the depression and anxiety numbers of a generation addicted to social media and the dopamine hit of that next like. The casualties are in those who uh, are in disjointed families as each member comes home and then retires to their own separate room as they get on their own personal screen. The casualties are in wasted lives and opportunities of living the full lives of presence and purpose that Christ so deeply wants for you. Paul says the days are evil. This means war. But even in the midst of that, there is hope. There is hope for us because every time we say no, every time we put down the drink, every time we embrace Christ, Every time we lift our voice in song, every time we put our phones down, every time we fall on our face in prayer, every time we show up to small group or to church on Sundays, every time that we delete social media altogether off of our phones, every single time God meets us there. Every single time he shows up. It's like the prodigal father running to his son. The son who's turned his back, who sought the things of the world, as soon as his son turns back, the father is sprinting to embrace him. And here's what's crazy. The, the powerful part of that video, yes, the images, it's that song that's being sung behind it, and the mother singing it over her daughter. And what's really, there's this little verse that I didn't know until later in life. Zephaniah 317. It's not just us who sing songs to God. Yes, we sing to him as we've done this morning. He actually, the next two verses in this passage talk about us singing to God. But we have a father who delights over us so much that it brings him to song. Listen to what this says. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He's not weak. These things do not have power over him. He is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And listen, he will exult over you with loud singing. That's our Father. That's our God who welcomes us back and calls us home. He wants so much more. He wants so much more for us. So my encouragement to you this week, take an inventory of your life. What are the things you're giving yourself to? Even if you just don't think they're that big a deal. What are those things that are capturing our minds and our hearts? And let's work on just turning those back to our loving Father who's waiting to embrace us as we come home. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your words this morning. God, we thank you for the truth that's in them. God, we thank you for the wake-up call. God, it, it, it's so easy just to get lulled to sleep 
to get pulled towards the things of the world, to think that they're just not that big a deal. Everybody's doing them. God, but I thank you that you are gracious and merciful. I thank you for your steadfast love. God, that you forgive our sins as far as the east is from the west. God, as far as the heavens are above the earth is how great your love is for us. God, that as soon as we put down these things and turn back to you, God, you are there waiting to embrace us, to fill us with yourself, to fill us up with your spirit. God, so we invite you into our lives. God, prod, convict. God, you are not just after a part of us. God, you want to transform all of us, not because you're needy, but because you're good, because you're a loving father who wants the best for his children. God, so I pray that we would believe that truth this morning. I would believe that as we leave this place, God, that we would turn back to you. God, that we would run, welcome your embrace. God, and that as you transform our lives from the inside out, God, that rivers of life, rivers of joy, rivers of peace would flow in and through us and that they would begin to impact our families and our communities and our church. God, and that through that, you would begin to impact the world for yourself. God, thank you that you were patient with us. God, we fail at this time and time again, but you are good. Even in our thousandth time stumbling, God, you're there to take us home. I pray that we would believe that and we would begin to pursue more for our lives in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.